All right. So I think a number of you will recognize this picture. It's one of many famous images of the skies over Chelyabinsk, Russia in February 2013. Now, that morning, a huge fireball lit the sky, and a rock about 20 meters in length, weighing over 10,000 tons, exploded in the air with the power of several atomic bombs. For a lot of people, when they woke up that morning and read the news and watched those Russian dash, dash cam videos, it was the first time in really a while that public discourse focused on uh, you know, what was in space, what's beyond the Earth's atmosphere, and so on. But for people like me, and scientists, and astronomers, we think about this stuff every day. So I'm gonna to talk to you guys a little bit today about the work that I've done to take this data that we have on asteroids and make it easier to predict events, like the one that exploded over Russia, uh, make it easier for the public to understand, engage in, and contribute to science on these objects, and even to potentially discover new objects um, like the small asteroid that exploded. So before we get started, some background. Asteroids are rocks in space. Most of them orbit between Mars and Jupiter in what's known as the main belt or the asteroid belt. A number of them, about 10,000 of them, are classified as near-Earth objects or NEOs, which means that there's a probability that their paths can intersect with Earth. And of these NEOs, there are about 1,700 of them that are classified as potentially hazardous objects, which scientists spend a lot more time worrying about. Asteroids are not just these big existential threats, though. They're the remnants of a primordial solar system that formed over four billion years ago. And as a result, a lot of the basic materials that we find in asteroids are the same as the raw building blocks of what we have here on Earth. So what we're looking at is a false color image of the asteroid Vesta, which is a rock in space, contains things like lots of basic elements, water, ice, different kinds of rocks, as well as things like platinum group metals um, and other sorts of metals like nickel, iron, cobalt, and magnesium. Uh, and just to give you a sense of the scale here, uh, this, this rock that we're looking at, Vesta, is about 500 kilometers in diameter. So it's a huge amount of material, and it's sort of, um, available in an unprecedented way. It's very concentrated because it doesn't undergo the same weathering processes as what we encounter on Earth. Um, and as a result, this has attracted the attention of a number of different companies, such as uh, this one, Planetary Resources, which is funded by Larry Page, Eric Schmidt, Richard Branson, and a lot of people who want to go out and actually extract these resources from asteroids. So that's a quick overview. Uh, why am I telling you all of this? Where do I come in to all of this? Well, I'm a computer scientist. Uh, right now I'm a software engineer at Google. But prior to that, I built technology to work with this data that we had on asteroids and sold it to planetary resources. So the story begins, I guess, back in 2012 when I was wondering what, would I, like, what am I doing with my life and what am I actually interested in? I saw all these news articles on asteroids and thought it was very cool. And I wish that there was a way for computer scientists to get more involved in the data that we have available on this sort of stuff. So I began looking into the problem, and it turns out that with over 650,000 asteroids that we know about in our solar system, it is actually difficult for scientists to easily ask questions like uh, which asteroids were, uh, are, are gonna pass close to the Earth, or which asteroids are the easiest to get to if I want to plan a scientific mission to go out and study them. Or even questions like, um, you know, which asteroids would give me the greatest return on investment if I somehow did the R&D to extract resources from them. So going out and sort of looking at what's available to me online, first thing I came to was NASA JPL. So they have all this data, but unfortunately it was really only available in this form that uh, was really targeted towards scientists or people who spent eight years of their lives getting a PhD, very familiar with this uh, research and the orbital elements and so on, all the information that they need in order to gather this. I also looked at the Minor Planet Center. So the Minor Planet Center is the canonical, sort of like internationally recognized body that keeps track of everything in our solar system. Um, and they helpfully provide all this data 
in a neatly formatted ASCII table, which you can download as a text file every day. I thought that as someone who was uh, very interested in space, but didn't really have the training and so on to uh, actually work with this data and access it, it was very difficult to make sense of anything here. And this is one of the big gaps between what we have available today and what we need to get to if, if we want to go out and actually accomplish interesting things in space. So I started this project called Asterank, and it was named Asterank because I wanted to rank asteroids by, uh, you know, by, by whatever query you might have. So what Asterank does is it organizes, browses, and it visualizes the data that we have on these asteroids. But more than that, it is also a platform for public engagement with space. And the reason why I thought that this was important is because we're here in San Francisco, or Silicon Valley, the tech capital of the world, and very few people have the opportunity to really go out and understand the data that we have on space and see why it's, it's like such an exciting and interesting industry with a lot of unique challenges. So I wanted to create a way to make this data more universally accessible and empower people to uh, actually understand it and make contributions to it. So how did I do this? Well, the first step was to gather data. So I went out and I wrote crawlers for a number of different uh, data sources, including the two that we talked about, about half a dozen more, and um, picked up pretty much everything. So orbital parameters, uh, physical characteristics, light curves, and I also scraped economic sources, like the London Metal Exchange. And the next step is to calculate. So basically uh, enabling people to write functions that can be mapped over each of these asteroids that we know about, and the new ones as we discover them, that can estimate things like, uh, like what the what mining cost would be, how uh, easily uh, we can reach these asteroids, so shortest routes, which um, in space is actually different from just a simple distance calculation, um, and things like estimating asteroid composition and close passes and so on. And then finally, we put it all together in a database that makes it easy to ask questions and get answers about these objects in space. And it winds up looking like this. So this is um, basically a data view that answers the question, which asteroids would give me the greatest return on investment if I were to develop a way to go out and extract this stuff. And although the question is more just for fun, the, the point here is that we have all the data in front of us. And this used to be in 12 different data sources scattered around uh, behind scientific paywalls, that sort of thing. And now it's all available online. The thing is, this sort of looks like a spreadsheet, and I'm a more visual sort of person. So I turned to a technology called WebGL. WebGL is OpenGL in the browser. It lets you write programs that run on the GPU within uh, the browser, so in mostly JavaScript. And what this allowed is this really immersive view um, in the solar system that lets users go in and interact with the data uh, everything here is scientifically accurate as far as the positioning, the data that we're showing, and so on. It all comes from NASA, JPL, the Minor Planet Center. And I think it's a very powerful tool to actually go in and let people touch that information. So what we're looking at is the uh, cost-effectiveness view. The most, uh, I think the coolest thing, which I think we're about to switch to, is called the accessibility view. So. This view that we're changing to shows the objects in space that are the easiest to get to, meaning uh, in technical terms that they have low delta V, low energetic cost to go out and reach. Uh, uh, in other words, they, they wouldn't take that much rocket fuel. And I think the most interesting result here is that after doing the delta V calculations and mapping them across the set of all asteroids, I found that there are over 2,000 asteroids that are easier to get to than the moon in terms of energetic costs. And to me, that was a really uh, amazing thing because uh, it means that these opportunities are easier and more within reach than the moon was 45 years ago. So the data view is, or the, the visualization is not just a toy. When you pair it with the data view, you wind up with this very uh, sort of seamless interface that lets you browse 
individual objects, see them, understand them in context, and even ask specific questions like, which asteroids are going to pass close to the Earth soon? So you can see in the visualization that they sort of cluster around in the same spot when they all pass close to Earth. You can also do things like ask which are the smallest rocks in space, which is of interest to NASA right now because they are, um, they're planning an asteroid capture mission. So a lot of cool stuff you can do when you put the data in the hands of, of people and developers. Uh, this was just the tip of the iceberg, though. So the way asteroids are discovered right now, it's typically through uh, these big publicly funded sky surveys, governments, academic institutions, and so on. So we know about uh, 650,000, 700,000 asteroids right now, but the estimates, if we extrapolate at the rate that we're currently finding, are that there are over 10 million asteroids in the solar system, and a lot of those are the scarier ones, the ones that uh, sort of come out of nowhere and explode over Russia. So uh, a lot of these sky surveys currently depend on these old algorithms written in the 90s, the early 2000s, and that, that sort of like look, look at images, decide whether or not there's something interesting in there, and either elevate it to a human being or just file it away forever. And I thought this was a shame. So I went out and I sort of tracked down where all this data was. And there are, over, there, there are many terabytes, uh, tens of terabytes, depending on which sky survey you're talking about, of imagery that really no person has ever looked at. And we know just by the law of numbers that there are uh, a number of these images contain undiscovered asteroids. So I built an app that lets you essentially go in and review these sky survey images. And um, it's, it's pretty hard to see here, but uh, basically what I do is I, I stack images from uh, different time frames and do what's called blinking. So this is how um, asteroids are typically discovered, but now I can do it across all this sky survey data that we got, across several million images, and, um, and we, we've had some success with this approach. There are about uh, 200,000 images that were reviewed this way, and several thousand potential new objects spotted in these images. Uh, and this is something that anyone online can, can go and do, so I thought that was great. Um, I also do other stuff. There's a lot of stuff you can do with data that comes from space, so I've worked with people who are planning the next missions to the moon. Um, Another cool thing is exoplanets. So these are planets that were discovered outside of the solar system. Doing visualizations on that so scientists can actually uh, spot correlations and, and uh, understand their data better. Things like, um, I guess this is, a, this is a visualization of the largest n-body physics simulation ever run. So uh, they, the, these scientists were simulating the entire universe. Um, and sort of studying galaxy formation and how dark matter forms and changes. So each point of light in this picture is a, uh, is a, is a galaxy. Um, so I guess what is the point of all this? Uh, well, I, I've open sourced nearly everything that we see here, right? So I've spent uh, a lot of time thinking about how to better visualize space data, how to take this data and open it to people, write APIs in ways that are actually useful. Uh, so the, the initial project that I showed you had uh, several million hits over the first few months. I already mentioned the sky survey images. Uh, this stuff is actually used in schools and universities. That surprised me when that first happened. Um, and I've engaged hundreds of developers on communities like GitHub uh, through hackathons. Um, and through other partnerships with individual uh, organizations like NASA and the SETI Institute and so on. And then, uh, I guess on top of that, what, one of the points that I want to make is that space is quickly becoming a data problem, more so than a, uh, like a, a rocket science problem. So if you have an interest in data, there is a very good chance that you may be able to do uh, really amazing or really impactful things in other industries. The space industry is just one example where they're sort of chronically several decades behind in terms of technology. 
But there's a lot of opportunity here to be creative with what you're doing. And when I joined Planetary Resources and was working on their spacecraft, I realized that a lot of the same basic principles uh, that I applied to the data that I have today also apply to the problems that we had on the spacecraft. So uh, the first example, I guess, is um, I guess on, on top of that, uh, there are a lot of unique data challenges. So the first example of, of that is onboard telemetry. So you have these very small satellites where you're dealing with these really unusual constraints that we normally don't have to deal with these days, um, you know, with AWS or whatever. But you're literally, you literally have uh, several hundred megabytes of RAM, only a couple gigs of disk space. You have a power constrained CPU and you're collecting data from 20 sensors. You have to be very smart about what is actually worthwhile, um, what's noise, what you're gonna store, how you're gonna store it, and so on. Another uh, interesting challenge is compression and transmission of data. So because you have so little disk space, um, you know, that, that, that is, that's definitely a problem, but you also have a very narrow pipe down to Earth. Because of the way that low Earth orbits work, uh, you may, unless you invest in ground stations across the world, you may not be able to actually talk to your satellite for hours or even days. So a lot of this information is stuff you can't store. If you can store it, you only have a couple kilobits per second uh, depending uh, in order to transfer it down. So there's a lot of like interesting challenges associated with that. Um, a related topic is autonomy. Um, so while your satellite is sort of off on its own, not in communication, uh, it's important to uh, make good decisions about the data that you have. Um, lots of interesting things you could do with that, especially in such a constrained environment. And finally, I think that open source is, uh, is going to make a big impact in, in space. And it's only sort of started to happen with uh, what are called CubeSats, which are these small open source plans for tiny satellites, but as, uh, as, as it becomes cheaper and cheaper to get into space and as more people um, are sort of realizing that this is possible, open source is gonna play a huge role. And I think that, um, I think that the reason why I've done all this work is first of all because I really enjoy it. I really like visualizing this stuff, sharing it with people. But I think that the key to get people involved and get people to understand the challenges and uh, get excited about data is to let them actually reach out and touch it. So to do these visualizations. And I really think that this sort of stuff is um, what's gonna inspire this generation and the next generation to turn uh, our dreams of space into reality. So thanks.